Fine. Want to move a mountain? There's one. Go ahead. Move it. Move it. Move it for everyone. You don't have to do it. You're just trying to humiliate you. Hey, 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 How much faith does it take to move a mountain? And Jesus is going to give us that answer. Matthew 17, 20, I tell you the truth, if you had faith even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it would move. What does it mean if when we speak to the mountain, everything else moves except the mountain? Do I not have enough faith? Is what I see limiting my faith? We were talking about this last week, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, where we walk by faith, not by sight. The question in all of this is, do we believe God has the final say? All right, so, all right, so Wednesday night Bible study, and East is next weekend, right? Am I right? Yeah, right. Okay, so remember, there will be no Saturday night service and no filming next week, Jim. So, we do the Lord's Supper on Sunday morning. No, 9.30 to 10.30, 11 to 12, all right? And um, other than that, no, we do bring food that day too. So if you want to get a meal, come on down. So what do you give a dog that has a high temperature? Mustard. It's the best thing for a hot dog, right? How do we move mountains? We must it up the courage. When in doubt, throw doubt out and have a little faith. Faith the size of a mustard seed produces mountain-sized hope. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. It happens quietly. It happens inevitably. Don't underestimate God's power. No faith is required to do the possible. Actually, only a morsel of this atom-powered stuff is needed to do the impossible. For a piece as large as a mustard seed will do more than we have ever dreamed of. And so we, last week we talked about the struggle of faith. And this week we're talking about the size of faith. And the week after um, Easter, we're going to talk about the foundation of faith, how we actually build a foundation on faith. So attitude, why would I hunger for power, riches, or fame? Because my God is so much better than all of these things. Now, this is a certain attitude that's required for faith to work. And that has to be this total devotion that we have to God, that he's worth more to me than anything this world could offer. Results, I won't be shaken, I won't be moved. My God is faithful, his promise is true. And I'll show you through this message is how his promises play a part of that. In action, so I speak to the mountains, tell them it's time to move because my God is bigger, better, stronger than you. And so it requires an attitude to have an attitude of faith, an attitude toward God. So the title of the message today is Speak to the Mountain. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your word, Lord, and I pray you'd help us all to understand a little bit more about this mustard size faith that can move mountains, Lord. And um, 
Help us to understand that more, God, and to be able to apply that in our lives, God. In the precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus, we pray, God. Amen. Faith is the avenue to salvation, not intellectual understanding, not money, not your works, just simple faith. How much faith? The faith of a mustard seed so small you can hardly see it. But if you put that little faith in the person of Jesus, your life will be changed. He will come with supernatural power into your heart, and it can happen to you. Billy Graham. Matthew 13, 31, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed planted in a field. Our faith begins with a tiny seed of the gospel planted in our heart. Somebody came along and shared the gospel with you. And the kingdom of God is planted in you through that tiny little seed. Mark 4, 3, and 8, listen, a farmer went out to sow seeds. A small seed of faith that grows into something big. Still others' seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, and some 100-fold. You know, that's the parable Jesus uses about the Word of God. The, the seed here is the Word of God. And when it talks about when it, when it comes into fruition to a heart, when, when faith is genuine in a person's heart, that person, on the other hand, produces more for the kingdom. And one tiny seed can produce a large crop for the kingdom of God. You could reach multiple people for the kingdom of God over one seed planted in your heart. Just like a mustard seed, God's word produces faith in us that we are to share with others through the preaching of the gospel, which produces faith in them that they share with others. And how much we share is how much of a crop will produce, he'll produce through us. Remember that. So if I have a a little tiny God and you have a big God and who's going to get more crops? It's, it doesn't take, you don't have to be a genius. The more faithful you are with the word of God and sharing that with others, the more faithful God will be using you to draw others into the kingdom. You can't expect to get what you're not putting out, right? And it's, it applies to all areas of life. A small seed of faith that grows into something that can remove giant obstacles. Matthew 17, 20, I tell you the truth, if you had faith even small as a mustard seed, you could say this mountain move from here to there, and it would move. A small seed of faith that grows into something that can remove any obstacle. Matthew 17, 20, I tell you the truth, if you had faith even as small as a mustard seed, you could say this mountain move from here to there, and it would move. Nothing would be impossible for you. Boy, that's a bold claim, huh? Any obstacle. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, with God all things are possible. Nothing will be impossible for you. And that, that's just a scenario where Christ is saying, so obviously these people with a lot of money don't have really any dependence on God nor need for God. And he's saying the odds of a person who's actually rich to get into the kingdom of God is like a camel going through the eye of a needle. And, but then at the other side, two, 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 two verses later, he says, but with God, it's possible. Because God picks and chooses, and he saves, right? Jesus gave us an example of the type of faith in act, this type of faith in action. Matthew 21, 18 and 19 says this. Early in the morning, as Jesus was on his way back to the city, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the road, he went up to it, but found nothing on it except leaves. Then he said to it, may you never bear fruit again, and immediately the tree withered. Immediately. Can right? you imagine that type of power? With Christ, the power he actually had. Um, that's actually a picture, picture of Israel um, where God is no longer going to use, no longer going to use, this is just prior to him going to the cross, he's no longer going to use Israel to reach the world for God anymore, but that's going to be given to the church. And, and in 70 AD is when the Romans came in and destroyed Israel and took the religious system away, and now it's the church that spreads the gospel through the world. So in spite of all the other miracles they had already seen, this particular miracle blew the disciples' mind. Matthew 7, 21, 20. When the disciples saw this, they were what? They were amazed. So he comes along, he sees this fig tree, and he, and he curses it, and immediately just kind of dried up and went away. And his disciples looked at it, and they were just, wow. Right? Now here's the problem with that. In spite of all the miracles they had already seen, right? He started off turning water into wine. He fed thousands with a few loaves. Blind people received their sight, lepers were cleansed, lame, handicapped, people restored. He walked on water, he calmed storms, he brought people back from the dead. Even though this particular miracle fails in comparison to these, this 
fig tree withering amaze them. Does that really make any sense? You watch Christ walk on water, but the fig tree brings you more amazement than that. All right? Even though they experienced doing some of the other miracles themselves, in Matthew 10, 1, Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. And so they were going around doing these things, right? And then Luke 10, 17 is when the 72 disciples returned, they joyfully reported to him, Lord, even the demons obey us when we use your name. They were casting out demons. They were healing people. They were doing these things themselves. Christ gave them the power to do that. But yet still the fig tree withering is the one that amazed them. And although there are many recordings of the crowd being amazed, there is nothing recorded of the disciples' amazement over a particular miracle like this. Matthew 21, 20, how did the fig tree wither so quickly? So they see this happen, so they immediately have this question, right? But what were they really asking Christ? This is, there is a reason why this is so amazing to them. Jesus knew what they were asking. How can we do that? Now, he gave them the ability to do the other things, right? And he, they were saying, how, how do we do that one? And Jesus answered and said to them, Truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will be able to do what was done to this fig tree. But now he's going to make it even more appealing to them. He says in Matthew 21, 18, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, that's not all you will be able to do with this type of faith. This faith will do a lot more than wither a fig tree. You will have faith that can move mountains. Matthew 21, 18, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, it will happen. But see, then he's going to add even a little bit more. That's not all you'll be able to do. You'll be able to do anything. And whatever you ask in prayer believing, you will receive it all. Wow, that's a pretty big promise. Huh? Imagine that. Anything you ask is yours. If you have this type of faith. Anything. You can do anything. They were amazed. Faith that can produce a crop a hundred times more than planted. A faith that could cause a tree to dry up immediately. A faith that can cause mountains to move. A faith that can cast mountains into the ocean. A faith that whatever I ask, I will receive. A faith where nothing would be impossible. They were amazed. They wanted that. Who wouldn't? Can you imagine how much power you would have with this ability? You could do anything you planned or desired. This particular faith would put the power of God right in your hands. Name it and claim it. Whatever you wanted. And we could have and do whatever we wanted. Now here's the question. If we actually had this type of power, what would we do with this type of power? As soon as you apologize and make a full reckoning of your transgressions, I shall absolve you and continue along the path of righteousness. <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about, man? Yeah, hey, you got kind of funny, you know what I mean? I don't know if you lost it all up in here or what, but check this out. Homie. You want me and the homies to apologize, right? Mm -hmm. All right, go, go. I'll tell you what, we'll apologize. The damn monkey comes out my butt, then you get your sorry. How about that? <laughs> Because that's today. We'd be using that power 
for our own personal gain, wouldn't we? Anything, anybody who wronged us, we would get whatever we wanted. In Luke 9, 54, look what the disciples wanted. When James and John saw this, they said to Jesus, Lord, should we call down fire from heaven and burn them up? Would be a lot of people burned up, a lot of monkeys, right? A lot of monkeys. But Jesus rebuked them for the use of power, misuse of power. Luke 9, 55, but Jesus turned and rebuked them. This power was never meant to be used in this way, nor would it work in this way. And there are requirements for this type of faith to work. In 1 John 5, 14, this is the confidence we have in approaching God that if we ask anything according to, what? Well, his will, right? He hears us. According to his will, John 14, 13, or whatever you ask in my name, this will I do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Now, in order for that verse to work, though, you have to apply the verses prior to it. So the preceding verses that leads up to this statement are essential to understand what Jesus was saying. In verse 10, the Lord says, Do not believe that I am do you, do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words which I speak to you. I do not speak for myself, but the Father who abides in me, he does his work. Here we see that whatever the Lord's, whenever the Lord speaks is, is the Father's work. This means that the Lord's word is the expression of the Father. The Lord is speaking, the Lord speaking expressed the Father, and the expression is a matter of glorification. In verse 11 and 12, the Lord goes on to say, Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, but if not, believe me because of the works themselves. Truly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works which I do, he shall also do, and he shall do greater than these, because I go to the Father. And when the Lord went to the Father, he brought us unto the Father. Hence, where he is, there we are also. Now we can do the same thing the Lord did. And what did the Lord do? He expressed the Father. And then it says, And whatever you ask in my name, this will I do so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And what do we do? We express the Father. So for this faith to work, it has to be in somehow, in some way, expressing the Father and the Father's will. In Matthew 5, 16, in the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and what? Glorify your Father. So in somehow, in some way, the thing we're asking has to glorify God. We bring glory to God, 1 Corinthians 10, 31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Bring glory to God is a requirement for this faith to work. So we seek and focus on the kingdom of God. We seek to further the kingdom of God, his righteousness, which is Christ, his righteousness, which is sanctification, his righteousness, which is holiness, his word that teaches us all these things. Our focus must be on the kingdom, and that's why Christ said, but seek ye first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you, or I will take care of the rest of your life. And so our aim and our focus has to be correct in this life for this type of faith to work in our lives. And so a lot of churches preach this name and claim it Christianity. That is not true. They leave out all the other essentials for this type of faith to work. God in no way has said that if you name it and claim it, you're going to be rich or everything you are going to want is going to happen. Now, if you're pursuing the kingdom of God, he says, well, well, that's a different story. And so our pursuits have to be correct. Any disqualifications for this type of faith? James 4, 2 through 3 says, You ask and you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend what you, re what you request on your what? Pleasures. Right? If we ask and seek the same things unsaved people say, seek, what does he say? You adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again, if you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. All right? We ask and receive not. Right? I've been asking God for one of those for years. Right? It's only like $300,000. Now, why do you think he's not going to give it to me? Because that's for my own pleasure, right? I, I always say, but God, it's big. I can bring three people to church, four people to church. You get my point, right? They has to be asking for the right motives. And it has to be asking for things that are going to help furthering the furthering of the kingdom of God. Right? 
qualifications for this work to work are asking according to God's will, asking to glorify the Father, doing it all for the glory of God, living for the kingdom purpose, disqualifications, asking according to our will, asking so we are glorified for our personal gain and glory, living for worldly purposes and pleasures, and that's the flesh against the spirit. Faith that moves mountains, I examine my life, my intentions before, and my intentions before I ask, I ask according to God's will, asking so the Father would be glorified, living for the glory of God, living for the kingdom purposes. Now here, here's, here, here's where it comes. So my point is, when we're asking things for God, we have to sit back and analyze it. Am I asking in the right purposes? Do I have the right motives in mind for this type of faith to work? Right? Now here's a question. What if I'm asking God with the right motives, intentions, and the mountain is not moving? What then? We're into a situation where my intentions are correct. I'm trying to do what God wants me to do. I want to, I'm here, I know why I'm here. I'm here just passing through. I'm here to labor for the kingdom of God. And my intentions are correct. And my life is sold out for his purposes. And yet I'm still asking and nothing's happening. What now? about if you've given God authority over your life and you've been praying for something and doing everything that is in your power to make it happen and it's not at what point can you say okay this is not God's will and at what point should you just continue trying um, that's a good question and I think the answer to that is you never really want to say if this is not God's will if what you are seeking and praying for is for his glory? That's the question. Um, I don't know what the specific thing is you're thinking of, but when you're, for example, let's take, you're praying for somebody to come to salvation. You, um, you, you don't ever want to get to the point where you say, well, I've been praying for, <laughs> I don't know, half an hour here. And, uh, or or I've been praying for 30 days, or I've been praying for two years. You, you don't ever want to assume that it's not God's will to save someone. Uh, that's presumptuous. You can assume, however, that it's not yet God's time. I think the thing that has to co cover your prayer at all times is, God, if this is your will, do this. And you pray, and you keep praying, and you keep praying, and sometimes you pray for a long time, many years, decades. You, you, you just, since you don't know God's will, you can't say it is God's will, nor could you say, oh, well, it's not his will. I had a, I had a very prominent preacher say to me, somebody you would all know, uh, say to me, I have a child that's not elect. I said, what? What do you mean you have a child that's not elect? I have a child that's not elect. I said, well, why would you say that? Well, because this child has not come to Christ, and it's been a long time. And the direction of the life of this child is opposite. <laughs> I was very surprised by that. By the way, that particular child is now in Christ and serving alongside that father. So I teased him a little bit about his inside knowledge of who's elect and who's not. <laughs> You just don't want to get to the point where you decide that God's going to act in your time or you're going to think it's not his will. So depending on what it is, if you're praying for God's will in a certain situation, keep praying. God hears you just because you're faithful. That's called importunity. You know, like the guy who knocks and knocks and knocks and knocks. And if somebody's going to do what you want just because you keep banging and he's, he's irritated, what will God do? do for you when you keep asking and he loves you so don't give up and i want to give you that verse luke 11 5 and 8 says then teaching them more about prayer he used this story suppose you want went to a friend's house at midnight so i went over to your house scott at 12. you're in bed going to out cold right and uh he said hey can i, can I borrow three loaves of bread you say to him a friend of mine has just arrived for a visit and I have nothing for him to eat. Now I'm asking for the right reasons, right? I'm not, I'm not asking, I'm not, this is not selfish. I really want to feed this guy. So that my, my intentions are, are good. 
And suppose he calls up from his bedroom and says, don't bother me, the door is locked for the night and my family and I are in bed, I can't help you. So I'm not getting what I'm asking for, right? I mean, what does Christ say? But I tell you, though he won't do it for friendship's sake, if you keep knocking long enough, <laughs> he'll get up and give you whatever you need to get rid of you, right? You, you became annoying, and I, you know, this guy's going to keep knocking on my door all night long unless I give him this bread, right? And Christ uses that as an example of prayer. Because of your shameless persistence, you will get the help you're looking for, right? And he does persistent faith required from Mount Moving, Luke 11, 9. And so I tell you, keep on asking, and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking, and you will find. Keep on knocking, and the door will be open to you. Persistent faith that moves impossible people. And so he gives us another example. It's a very similar situation. As one day, Jesus told his disciples a story to show that they should always pray and what? Never give up. There was a judge in a certain city, and he said, who neither feared God nor cared about people. And a widow of the city came to him repeatedly saying, give me justice in this dispute with my enemy. The judge ignored her for a while, but finally he said to himself, I don't fear God or care about people, but this woman is driving me crazy. She just keeps coming. She won't go away. She's annoying. I'm going to I'm gonna see that she gets justice because, just because she's wearing me out with a constant request. That's how Christ tells you to pray. Interesting, huh? Persistent faith moves God. Luke 18, 6 through 8. Then the Lord said, learn a lesson from the unjust judge. Even he rendered a just decision in the end. So don't you think God will surely give justice to his chosen people who cry to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will grant justice to them quickly. But when the Son of Man returns, how many will he find with that type of faith on earth? How many persistent people will he have found? I wonder how many people never got their prayer request simply because they just gave up. Right? Persistent faith. You want to move mountains in your life. It's not going to happen like that. You're going to be a persistent faith type of person. Mustard seed faith is persistent. I tell you the truth. If you had faith even as small as a mustard seed. Right? The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and planted in his field. Knowing what a mustard seed does planted will help you understand what Jesus was pointing out. What would happen if I planted a mustard seed in my backyard? Just one. Just plant one. I'll give you an idea. I must have planted a common weed, that's what it was considered back at this time, was forbidden in a household garden because it was fast spreading and would tend to invade the landscape and vegetables. Mustard seed. Mustard is a serious concern in forests across North America. While it is edible for people as a self-pollinated plant with a high seed production rate, it spreads rapidly. A strand of mustard can produce more than 62,000 seeds per square meter, easily outcompeting and quickly changing the structure of a native plant communities in a relatively stable forest. It will devour everything. It will just keep spreading and spreading and spreading. All right? Even though a mustard seed is very small, it's an aggressive plant that will not quit. It will overcome much larger plant life without anyone keeping it in, keeping it in check. It was outlawed, and this is why the interesting is Jesus using this parable. In Jesus' day, mustard seed was outlawed in the land to use. All right? Faith that moves mountains is aggressive. It will not quit. It's not the size of the faith that he's talking about. Truly, I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, it's the attitude of the faith. It's committed to accomplish what God made it to do, and it will not quit. You want to move mountains? You want to have a great faith? You just have to have a faith that's not going to quit. I'm not giving up. I don't care what's going on in my life. I'm pressing on. I'm here to serve God, and I'm going to do that, and you don't quit. Whatever obstacles are in front of you, you keep praying. You keep walking forward. An example of failed faith by the disciples of Jesus, Matthew 17, 14. So let's look at the disciples, and I'm going to show you something in a place that they failed, and Christ is going to um, give us some advice in this area. So in Matthew 17, 14, it says this. At the foot of the mountain, a large crowd was waiting for them. All right, so this event takes place after the transfiguration of Jesus. This is heading into the last week or so of, of Christ before he would go to the cross. And he went up to the mount, mount with um, uh, James, Peter, and John, and he was transfigured before them. And it says this, there he was transfigured before him, his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as light. So he's transfigured back into his, 
his heavenly body right before them, right? And I'm not sure if you guys have read that. And so Jesus, Peter, James, and John, now that, that happens. Now they're coming down the mountain, right? Jesus, Peter, James, and John are coming down from the mountain with Jesus, right? Uh, to join the other disciples, and they find a large crowd at the bottom of the mountain waiting for them. Now the rest of the disciples were in a dilemma. So remember, there's only three of them with them. The rest, the, the nine others are at the bottom of the mountain and there's something going on. This crowd is waiting, waiting, right? Mark 9, 14, when they returned to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd surrounding them and some teachers of the religious law were arguing, arguing with them, okay? A large crowd is surrounding the other disciples and the Pharisees and the Sadducees are arguing with his disciples. The Pharisees and Sadducees, that's the Sanhedrin, would prefer to argue with Jesus' disciples rather than Jesus. And uh, Mark 9, 14, some teachers of religious law were arguing with them, right? They never really had any great success arguing with Jesus, and that's why it says in Luke 20, 39 and 40, some of the teachers of the law responded, well said, teacher, and no one dared ask him any more questions. So they, the Pharisees and Sadducees had already resigned to the fact that we're not going to get into any uh, arguments with this guy because he beats us every single time with words, all right? And so that was a decision they already made. But they didn't have a problem arguing with his disciples, and Jesus wasn't around, okay? Um, every time they argue with Jesus, he put them to shame publicly, and so they, they had resigned, let's not do that anymore, because we're, we're losing people because of that, all right? When Jesus shows up, the arguing immediately stops. This is a really great story to read. And the crowd shifts towards Christ, it says in Mark 9, 15, immediately when the entire crowd saw him, they were amazed and began running up to greet him. Now Jesus inquires of them. Mark 9, 16 says, what is this arguing about? What are, what are you guys arguing about? And, and uh, he doesn't get an answer. So they, neither the religious leaders, remember, they decided they already weren't going to argue with him, right? Neither the religious leaders, now, nor his disciples give him an answer for entirely different reasons. So neither, what are you arguing about? No answer. Quiet. You can hear a pin drop. His disciples aren't talking why, why they're arguing, nor are the religious leaders. Now we know why the religious leaders did not answer him, and no one did to ask him any more questions. They had already decided, like I said. They were not going to embarrass themselves in front of the crowd that they were trying to persuade to follow them, not Jesus. So that would work against their cause. Now, why the disciples gave him no answer, we'll find out later in the account. What is all this arguing about, Jesus asked. Nobody answers. And while there is dead silence between the groups, there's dead silence, remember? Somebody else shows up on the scene in Mark 9, 17. says, and one person from the crowd answered him. Somebody just walks up and answers him, right? Matthew gives us more insight. Matthew, uh, a man came and knelt before Jesus and said. So that's why you read the different Gospels. Um, when you're reading a story, sometimes you go to the other Gospel, and the guy, he's writing his story, and it adds to the account. So this guy just didn't show up. He showed, he showed up and got on his knees before him. Somebody else is a dad with a huge problem. And Mark 9, 17 and 18 says, Teacher, I, I brought you my son because he has a spirit that makes him unable to speak. And whenever it seizes him, it slams him to the ground, and he foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth and becomes stiff. And the question is, how could this situation cause all this commotion and cause all this arguing? Now the dilemma is revealed, Mark 9, 18. So I asked his disciples to cast the evil spirit out, but what? They couldn't do it. They just couldn't do it. They ran into a mountain, right? They ran into a situation where they were able to do things before, but for some reason, it's not working. They did it before, Luke 10, 17. They joyfully reported to him, Lord, even the demons obey us when we use your names. They've already cast out demons before, but for some reason, when they approach this situation, it's not working. Right? They couldn't do it now, Mark 19, but they couldn't do it. And this gives us some insight to the arguments. And what's going on here is they went to do it, and it didn't work. And now all the religious leaders are going, oh, yeah, right, yeah. You're all talk. Right? 
So now they're arguing back and forth, and you know, probably arguing with the same things Christ argued with them about, but again, they weren't successful with Christ. But this was a big, big thing for the Pharisees and Sadducees to go, see, we told you people it doesn't work, come follow us, right? So all this is going on, insight as to why um, they were silent, they were embarrassed to tell Jesus of their failure. See, before they were going, wow, it works. Now Christ goes, what's going on here? No answer, right? They're embarrassed, to, they're thinking, why isn't it working? What am I doing wrong? Jesus responds to the Father's dilemma, Mark 9, 19, and he answered them and said, Oh, unbelieving generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring them to me. That's his response to it. Everybody in this account has some sort of unbelief and doubt. The religious leaders did not believe he was the promised Messiah despite all the miracles he did to prove it. I mean, if you look at the things Christ did, and if you've seen those things, I mean... How could you not believe? It says everybody who came to him was healed. How could you not see that and say, oof, right? But they didn't. They just said, chosen, listen, we're going to kill him. And John 10, 38, 39, but if I do his work, believe in the evidence of the miraculous, Jesus talking, but if I do his work, believe in the evidence of the miraculous works I have done. Even if you don't believe me, then you will know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. Is he saying, what's he saying? It's impossible for me to do these things if I'm not God. I'm walking on water. I'm calming storms. I'm bringing people back from the dead. I'm healing the blind. What more do you need to see? Right? The disciples and, and the Father's unbelief will show up in a moment. So we see the unbelief of the, the religious leaders. Now, right? This, so we'll continue with the story. So Christ's lordship is displayed by the demon, right? Mark 9, 20. And this is, you know, when you watch Christ, when a demon-possessed person approaches, they always respond the same way. So they brought the boy, but when the evil spirit saw who? Jesus. Because they know who Jesus is. It threw the child into a violent convulsion, and he what? Fell to the ground. And every time a demon-possessed person became for Christ, they bowed in submission to him. Because the demons know who he is. Right? And one, at one point, didn't the demons cry out and say, have you come to judge us before our time? They knew who he was. And Jesus said, keep silent. Because we know who you are, the Holy One of God. Right? So the demons had correct theology on who Christ was. And so Jesus goes on to ask some questions. So now we got the fathers bowing bound before him. We got the child who's demon-possessed who's, who's down on the ground before him. He says, how long, now he starts talking to the father. How long has this been happening? Jesus asked the boy's father, he replied, since he was a little boy. And the spirit often throws him into the fire, into the water, trying to kill him. Have mercy on, on us and help us. And then he says this, what? If you can. If you, if you can. That's the father's doubt showing up. Can you, you know, we, I just, your disciples couldn't do it. If you can. And what, what's Jesus' response to the father's Right? So the father was acknowledging Christ's lordship on his knees before Christ, this conversation, right? Mark 9, 24, immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I, I do believe. The father's unbelief showing up, right? Help my what? Unbelief. And so when he says, um, if you can help me, Jesus says this, if I can. If I can. <laughs> Anything is possible for someone who believes. If I can. Have you seen everything else I've done? And so now the father gets on his, he's on his knees and says, immediately the boy's father is saying, I do believe, help me overcome my what? Unbelief. And the father's unbelief shows up. Now Christ's authority over the kingdom of darkness on display, Mark 9, 25, when Jesus saw the crowd was rapidly gathering, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, you mute and deaf spirit, I command you to come out of him and do not enter him again. And after crying out, listen, this is immediate. This is the power Christ has over demons, which are simply fallen angels. And after crying out and throwing him into a terrible convulsion, it came out, and the boy became so much like a corpse that most of them said, he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and raised him up, and he got up. And Luke 9, 24 adds this, then he gave him back to his father. That's how quick. That's how quick this. The disciples couldn't do it. Nobody could do this job. Jesus shows up, asks a few questions, and goes, leave. Boom. It immediately happened hands him back to the Father. 
Christ's compassion upon the Father with doubt and unbelief. So remember, the Father had doubt. He had his unbeliefs, right? Now here's the dilemma of the disciples. After it happens, and that, that part happens really quick, and after when Jesus was alone in the house with the disciples, they asked him, why couldn't we cast out the evil spirit? Why didn't it work for us? We were doing everything you want us to do. We were, we were, we were out to further the kingdom of God. We were doing everything you asked us to do. Well, why couldn't we do this? We've done it before. What happened here? Well, the dilemma of the disciples, he replied, because what? You have so little faith. How big does my faith have to be for it to work? Don't you think that's the first thing you would go down in your mindset? Like, okay, really, I've done before. For some reason, it's not working here. And then Jesus goes, just because your faith isn't big enough. So you'd immediately be start thinking, well, how big does my faith have to be? And this is his answer. Truly, I tell you, if your faith is small as a mustard seed, you can say this mountain move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be. Boy, that brings you a whole new meaning to that verse, doesn't it? And now they're going, what? I don't, my faith isn't that big? Wow. My faith is not bigger than this because you have so little faith? See, that's not what he meant. It's not bigger. You need to have faith more like this, like a mustard seed, right? However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. What did he say? You quit way too easy. You just gave up. Way too easy. Now you need faith like a mustard seed that never quits and never gives up. Right? Totally different type of faith. And the enemy of faith is doubt. Right? Jesus repeated this over and over. It says, but if God so clothes the grass of the, grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, Will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Matthew 8, 26. And he said to them, Why are you so afraid, O you of little faith? Matthew 14, 31. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O you of little faith, why did you doubt? Matthew 16, 18. But Jesus, was aware of this, said, O you of little faith, what are you discussing among yourselves? The fact that you have no bread? Matthew 17, 20. He said to them, Because of your little faith, right? See, the enemy of faith is always going to be unbelief, Matthew 13, 58, and he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Doubt is the enemy of faith. Commitment is the enemy of doubt. Even though it is the smallest of seeds, a mustard seed does not give up even in the face of doubt. It's okay to have some doubt. Did the father have some doubt? Did the father have some unbelief? No, the father could have walked away when the disciples couldn't do it, right? No, but he stuck around. He was persistent in his faith. 1 Corinthians 13, 7. Love never gives up. Love never what? Loses faith. It's committed. Faith that moves mountains believes and never gives up. It has the right attitude behind it. We've examined ourselves. We make sure we're, we're asking uh, with the right intentions that we're living for the kingdom of God. And if you're focused on those things, Christ said, don't give up. You keep praying. You'll be like a mustard seed. And you'll be able to move mountains. If you want to move mountains, never give up and trust God for the outcome. You know, do you really believe that God can do anything? Do you really believe that if he says if you, you, you focus your life on the furtherance of the kingdom of God, that he'll take care of the rest of your life? Do you really believe that the situations in our life that look impossible to us, God is easily able to overcome? And if you do, why quit? Keep praying. Be like a mustard seed. Drive God crazy. Oh, this guy never quits. All right, I'm going to do it. Right? 
What with Moses? He, he, God was going to destroy the entire people. He, God, con Moses convinced through prayer, stopped them. Prayer can move Almighty God. That's bigger than moving a mountain, isn't it? Remember, prayer can move the God who can move the mountain. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your word, and we thank you, God. There's hope, God, in sometimes the darkest parts of our lives, Lord. Help us, Lord, to be concentrating on the furtherance of the kingdom. And keep praying persistently like a mustard seed, God. And wait patiently you to move the mountains in our lives. In the precious name of Christ, we pray these things.